Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. Our theme for tonight's program focuses on what are the correct criteria for determining the true church, the right church. Now, we could be looking at that in the big sense, you know, denominationally, traditionally, which is part of what we'll be looking at. But in some sense, I'm looking at it on down the local level where most of us encounter this question. In a local community where there's 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 churches, how do you determine which of those is true, especially when on any given city block there's a church on every corner? And having been a Protestant minister, and I remember every year my new members' classes mm -hmm. were made up of ex-members of all these other churches in mm -hmm. town, and I often had to tell them why they should come to my Presbyterian mm -hmm. church versus... What are the criteria? How do you determine which church is true? Well, that's the theme that our guest tonight, Glenn mm -hmm. Allen, will mm -hmm. be addressing. It's look forward to having Glenn on the program. Mm -hmm. He is a, a, a Baptist minister convert to the mm -hmm. church, but he'll mm -hmm. give his journey in just a bit. Remember, you're an important part of this program. Every week, your questions help guide, especially the second half of our program. So if you have any questions, give us a call at 1-800-221-9460, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Glenn, welcome to The Journey Glad Home. Glad to be here, Marcus. It's uh, great yeah, to have yeah. you here. And uh, you've come down from that cold place up north, Milwaukee. Yeah, but it's been pretty warm lately. So I was going to say, I'm yeah, joking yeah, a little yeah, bit because yeah, it can get just yeah. as hot. Yeah, our reputation and precedes us, but yeah, that's right. nice weather, too. Well, I'm, I'm used to Ohio, too. So oh. here you and I are both sweating mm. it out in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah this the humidity, heat, I'm, I'm wilting, but I'm hanging in there. Well, let's, let's get started right away. Mm. Share with the audience, if you, if you would, mm. your ir early spiritual journey. Well, my spiritual journey begins in the Methodist church. Um, I was born and baptized as an infant into that tradition. And my mother made sure that we got to Sunday school. She made sure that we went to vacation Bible school and went to church on pretty regular basis on Sunday as a family. We were not overly devout, but we learned about God. We learned to respect God. We learned about the scriptures and we got good Christian moral values. But you know how it is sometimes when you get a little, when you get away from the nest, so to speak, <laughs> you may drift away a little bit from those things. And that happened to me. I went away um, from home at 13, actually. I, I went to a um, private Catholic boarding school. <laughs> and, um, and that's where, and I was not only one of the few um, Protestants there, but I was also one of the few black students there, mm -hmm. too. And so as a Protestant, though, I was not required to go to mass. So, you know, I didn't have to. So I went to a couple, but they didn't appeal to me. Kind of weird stuff. <laughs> and so I stopped going. And in religion classes, I just kind of vegetated through those things until I get a grade. And in four years, nobody ever really witnessed to me and nobody really no explained the faith. You. Nobody tried to convert me. Mm -hmm. I was there for a good education, good Jesuit education. Mm -hmm. I got the four R's. I got three R's. I didn't get the fourth. I got reading, writing, arithmetic, but I didn't get religion. Huh. And so um, after that, I, when I, by the time I left there, matter of fact, though, some, some Horrible racial things happened to me. So by the time I left there, I was very angry. I did not care for um, white people, and I really didn't care for Catholics at that time. So I was really hard. So you got the anti R. I got the anti. You didn't, the just, anti, get, you didn't right. just not get religion. You got an anti view toward the Catholic Church. Right, yeah. right. I, had, I and I already didn't think there were um, much to offer in the first place. But now the, the, the bad experiences I had up there really turned me against them. So then I Christianity too? Oh uh, no, just just uh, just Catholics. Just Catholics. Right. Just Catholics. Okay. Um, and so um, I went from there to um, uh, Creighton for a short stay, and then I um, accepted a basketball scholarship at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, hmm. and that's where I met my future wife Elaine. <laughs> now Elaine is what I don't know if you know this term or not. She's a PK. That means she's a pastor's kid. Her father was one of the most prominent Baptist ministers in our community. And if you're going to date the pastor's daughter, it would behoove you <laughs> to show up at church every now and then. And so I start, especially Baptist. Especially Baptist. So I started coming to church more, and that, and I then I also started going back to my mom's um, Methodist church more. So I kind of got more religiously aware again. And so after I finished college, I took a job on the um, Milwaukee Fire Department, where I became a firefighter. 
And then about a year later, I married Elaine. And so now with those two things combined, uh -huh. starting a new family and having a job where you put your life on the line on a regular basis, I started contemplating more eternal matters. Uh -huh. And so I, I started reading my Bible more. I was witnessed to by a couple of Christian firefighters. And then so, and I became convicted that I need to know the Lord. And so in 1979, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. I became, I loved the Lord and I wanted to be His and I wanted to have a personal relationship. And so I entered into my father-in-law's church, which was Baptist, I was Methodist, so I was rebaptized, <laughs> you know, because um, in that tradition, they do not accept infant baptism. You have to be immersed yeah. after a profession of faith. And, and by the way, that baptism was no easy feat. <laughs> I'm, I'm six foot six, and so it took my father on a couple of deacons to get me down and back up again. Were you fighting it, or were you? No, I wasn't fighting. I was just, it's just, there's a small pool, and then, so, it, so I just, you know, to get getting me in that little bowl, that bowl was right, rough, right, right, right. <laughs> so um, that, we got through the baptism, and so after that, I, um, I became more active in my um, father-in-law's church. I started teaching youth classes. Um, speaking every down, now and then at a, at a special event. And so my father-in-law discerned in me. He said, I might have what it takes to be a preacher. And, but I think he had an ulterior motive because he always wanted a son to ministry. <laughs> and his only son did not go in that direction, so he saw another chance of getting that. But I think he really genuinely thought I had the equipment to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, and I respected him. Um, Ken Bowen was his name. I respected him. He's passed now. He was a man of um, a good pastor. He, he loved the Lord. He loved his people. He served his community. He was NAACP director. He was on the Fire and Police Commission. He was a chaplain at the largest hospital in Milwaukee. And so he was a man of good faith and of good works. And I respected him. So I, I heeded his advice. I prayed on it. And I felt the call into the ministry. And after he guaranteed me, by the way, that <laughs> I did not have to be a pastor to be um, to serve the Lord. I had no ambition to be a pastor, but I wanted to serve the Lord in some capacity. So there I was, now a new minister. He licensed me to preach, and I went on from there. And your wife's excited about all this change in your life? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yes, okay. of course. I mean, she was, you know, her father and me became good friends. She's, sometimes she said, I think he thinks that maybe... You're his kid. I'm his daughter. He spends more time with you. We had a great time. He'd come over to the house. We'd sit in the office and talk for hours. So we had a good relationship. Let's bring in the theme, this, uh, mm -hmm. the criteria for choosing a Catholic church. Back in your Baptist days, there you were, you were brought up Methodist, and right. now you're Baptist. Mm -hmm. If you think back when you were a Baptist, how would you have answered that question? What are the criteria for mm -hmm. determining which of all these churches yeah. is true? You know, some people pick a church for various reasons, you know. Um, does is it, is it have a good eloquent pastor? Does the choir sing good? Does it have a good youth program? Does it have a nice new building that's going up? Are they growing? Maybe racial mix, location, and um, is the pastor saying things I like? To the pastor saying does, does, <laughs> does he look like I like him to look? You know, yeah. <laughs> and all all those things they're not bad within themselves. But as a Baptist, I had some more criteria, and sometimes those came into play. But also, I wanted to know. Was he teaching the Bible alone? Is the church teaching the Bible alone? Were they teaching that you needed to have a personal relationship with Christ? You needed to get saved, come to Christ, and thereby get eternal security. Hmm. Were, after that you had the profession of faith, did you get baptized by immersion as an example of hmm. Christ? And, and, and were they having good, solid, strong Bible teaching? We had to have, and a memorial meal once a month. Not so much more, but those are important tenets. And so I would look at those things. Then those other peripheral um, things would come into play, but sometimes they would outweigh those other things because um, most, all Baptist churches have those beliefs. Mm. So how do you choose? Does it come down to style? Yeah. Does it come down because to charisma? We, we you do know? know that there are Baptist churches that look at other Baptist churches right. as if they're enemies almost. Right, right. right. They don't get along. And, my, and, and for instance, my father's in law's church is very structured. It was a Baptist. There have been other Baptist churches, but very, not structured at all. Yeah. You know? And um, so, you know, you can't, paint a, you can't paint a Baptist all in one brush. But um, so you had to, it was tough to try mm -hmm. to fight your way through all these things, and you had to use other criteria. Mm -hmm. But it was difficult, like you said, church on every corner. Which one do you go to? And often it was because a particular group would mm -hmm. emphasize this scripture, right. 
Whereas another group might emphasize right. this scripture right. on the same issue. On the same you know, issue. They pull a scripture out and have it highlighted. By, uh, faith alone with the evidence speaking in tongues. You know, you know there's right. something, uh, something uh, that they can use to differentiate themselves from the, from the masses. So, and you had to, how do you, how do you figure that out? Yeah. And I know from your background, that was also a personal struggle on this picking of different churches too. Right, right. And what happened was uh, after I had um, but I mean, within you know, your family. With my family, yeah, we were a close knit group, and we were all in the Methodist Church at that time, and we got along well. But then, about the same time I got saved, um, many of my siblings did too, and well, I noticed something happening. You had nine brothers and sisters. Nine brothers and sisters. So yeah. we have a large family. We, we had enough people that we could <laughs> go into. That's we a had, small Protestant right, church. Right. <laughs> we, had, we, had, we had Pentecostals, or Baptists, or non-denominational, or the faith, and so forth. We, had, we could hit just about every group. Huh. And so we did. We got, we, we got saved. And then we started, I noticed that there was fault lines developing in the family concrete. Yeah. And that, that disturbed me. And these fault lines, and, and all of a sudden, there seemed to be some tension in the family. We were, we were worried about who was saved, who had watered down Christianity, temperance, um, who taught the word, and so forth. And so there was a lot, little tension there. And, I, and then mm -hmm. uh, an incident happened where the, it caused a crack in the family concrete, and we cracked right along those denominational lines. Mm -hmm. And that disturbed me. I loved my family. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I told my light, wife, Elaine, I said, you know, religion, is ruining our family. Mm -hmm. We got along better before we got saved. Something <laughs> like being born again in Christ, you think would bring you together. But I realize now we were reflecting what happened even at the beginning of the yeah. Protestant movement, yeah. the tendency to disagree and divide. Well, I know at, this, at that point in time in your life, you weren't interpreting it that way, mm -hmm. as no. looking back, but let's go there. Was this the, the jumping off place for you moving towards the Catholic Church, or what was it that got your No, that was, that was, that sent me on a ch search for truth because I said to myself, what we're really disputing here is not what the Bible says. It's how you interpret the Bible. Yeah. That's what we were arguing about. And I said, we need, I need to find out not only who teaches the truth, but who has the authority to interpret mm -hmm. the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so that, that sent me in that direction. Okay. But what linked me toward other things, um, I, 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 um, after my, um, I became a minister, my father-in-law took ill in um, about 91, he became seriously ill. And he asked me would I um, help out more, would I step up to the pulpit and do, help him out more in his, in his time of need, and I couldn't say no. But I told him, look, I have to have more formation. If I'm gonna do this, <laughs> it's a different story from sitting in the pew and having things come at you and you can filter them or not than actually teaching somebody, yeah. and, and I'm responsible now. I don't want to lead anybody astray. I don't want to have a millstone around my neck. So, so I said I, I wanted to go uh, get some more training and be the best minister I could be. And so I started attending school, he agreed. And that's when the trouble started. <laughs> I, I enrolled at a local theology school in Milwaukee. And all of us, during the time there, are different classes I took, different um, Protestant ministers from different denominations and lay people and teachers came in teaching different things, yet all from claiming, other, yeah. from all claiming though, different truths that they went by the Bible alone, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they often conflicted each other. And sometimes they were even mean spirit about it. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I thought we're all Christians here. And they were always you know, it, it became finger pointing, and I was saying, wait a minute, which, they all claim to be led by the Spirit, Bible alone. How do I know which one is right? How can I judge between those two? I'm trying to learn it. And even more importantly, how can I yeah. know that I'm right? It's just my word against theirs, his word against mine. How can I determine who's teaching the truth? Who has it? And so frustrated at that, um, I went and down to my old woman Malta at UWM to get my um, transcript because I was just going to go somewhere. I just happened to find out, just happened, you know, maybe not now, I think God <laughs> was hands on this, and I, um, I noticed they t offered a um, degree in comparative study of religion. And so I said, why not? I got credits here, why not? 
So I enrolled in that major, but I also enrolled in a major, a minor in history. Now, Marcus, here <laughs> I am, a Protestant minister searching for truth and authority, taking comparative study of religion with a history um, a perspective. I was about to run head on to what I called the Newman Factor. <laughs> and I'm sure explain that. Well, yeah. Newman Factor um, is um, a Newman um, converted to the church, and one of his famous statements was that to be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. Hmm. And I didn't know it, but I, that is what I was running into yeah. head on. Hmm. Yeah. So you took comparative religion. This at a secular university. Secular university. So it, nothing, all of the, it was church history given to you without any denominational spin, using primary sources. That means the people who were there wrote it. So you could not go theology. You couldn't go to denomination. It was against the law. So hmm. you got nothing but the facts. And hmm. so remember the first class I took, um, it was an overview in Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And I was just so amazed about how little I knew about the church. Yeah. I felt so shortchanged. And I was a little angry that all these things had been held back from me. At the same time, I was just excited about everything I was learning. But I was just now getting, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story about Christianity. I go home and I tell Elaine, I said, you won't believe this. You gotta listen to this. You won't believe that. And one day she said, um, old man on campus, Mr. College boy, what are you gonna do with all these new things you're learning? I said, I don't know. I have no idea. But I knew I was hooked. And then one night when I was really troubled by some of these things I was learning, I couldn't sleep. I got up and I went into the living room and I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't care what Baptists say is true. I don't care what Catholics say is true. I don't care what Methodists say is true. I want to know what you say is true. And if you will guide me in the truth, if you will lead me in the truth, I promise I will obey and follow the truth no matter what. I ask you in the name of Jesus, lead me, guide me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs> you know what they say? Be careful, be careful what, what you pray for. for. <laughs> you just might get it. And boy, did I get it. God didn't just open the windows of heaven. He tore off the roof and he put on the halogen high beams and things are just coming at me right and left. It, it became almost unbearable. So much, so many things were happening. From the classes per se, mm -hmm. or was, uh, what else was? The classes. And, um, I think what propelled me into the, uh, uh, into look into it, the Catholic perspective too, was that I, I actually, I, I taught a class later and I took a class. Well, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Up until this time, mm -hmm. you're taking comparative religion. Mm -hmm. um, a, a course in comparative religion, religion would not have been trying to convert you to Catholicism. No, no. At some point in there, were you starting to consider the Catholic Church? as a possibility or were you just more no, being inspired? No, okay. no, Catholics? All right. Are you nuts? Okay. I didn't think Catholics were Christians. Okay. You know, they, 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 they had this Pope guy they thought who was infallible. They bowed down the statues. And you had had some pretty major I made some major things in, um, in my life. Um, um, you know, they were, they were a white man's church and I didn't appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they bowed down before bread. They, they even drank liquor in church. <laughs> you know, take one. You know, and so, and they had all these weird practices. No, I didn't even see them as um, Christians. Okay, so you got, you started to teach a class then? Yeah, I started to teach a class at my, I, my father-in-law passed and we had to leave um, that church. My wife was, the emotional stress was too much. So I went to my, uh, a church, a Baptist church where my good friend was pastoring. And he said, hey, you took that class last semester. Why don't you teach comparative living at, at the church on Wednesday nights? I said, sure, fine, I'll do that. And so um, during that class was when I ran into trouble, when I started leaning toward the Catholic Church. I broke it into four units. I was going to, um, first we reviewed Baptist Christian beliefs. Okay. Then I said, we're going to look at three non-Christian groups and compare. Non-Christian groups. Non-Christian groups. Okay. So the first group was Judaism. And uh, no problem comparing, contrasting, holding our ground. You know, what I did was, since I didn't like being shortchanged in my education, I would take um, their theologians and their teachers' viewpoints. I wouldn't take, you can't judge one religion by the eyes of the, um, say you can't look you, at. In other words, you didn't have a Baptist book about Judaism. Right, you right. Use I use their authors. theologians, their apologists. Right, okay. And so I, I'm comparing them. The next one was Islam. No problem comparing, contrasting, and holding that ground. The next unit now, 
show you where I was. The next non-Catholic, non non-Christian non unit that we were going to compare was Catholicism, <laughs> 1998. I didn't think Catholics were Christians yet. <laughs> and, so, um, and so now, side by side, in an analytical way, I would have the Baptist beliefs and their teachings, the Catholic beliefs and their teachings, the scriptures in the middle, I'm going to compare interpretations. And so now all of a sudden, I'm looking at this stuff, and it dawned on me that some of the Catholic interpretations of scripture were just as feasible and sometimes even fit better than my Baptist beliefs. And then with my historical perspective, I was taking an early church history class, I knew that what they were doing, what they were teaching was what the Christians were doing back then. So they were more historically accurate too. So I went home and I said, Elaine, this Catholic stuff is not as crazy as I thought it was. <laughs> and she said, what are you talking about? I said, you aren't thinking about becoming Catholic, are you? I said, are you nuts? <laughs> of course not, but, I, but this stuff, I gotta rule them out. I have to at least rule them out. And so, but I was, was not, this Was this the point in which Elaine had some real encouraging words about the Catholic Church? Oh, wow, well. Um, <laughs> or was this a little later? This is, this is, this is, a, this is not a, this is a, what, is it a family hour? No, this is what she <laughs> said. <laughs> I, I mean, this is the show during family hour, because she was, you know, I don't oh, okay. say, she okay. was very angry. You know, about if I even thought about it, because she made it clear. So she said, if you think about coming Catholic, let me make it clear to you. I will never, ever, ever, never, never, ever, never, ever, ever become Catholic. So I don't know where you're going with this. <laughs> so I said, well, no, don't worry about it. I'm just, I'm just doing to do some more studying. I'm just going to do some more studying. Don't worry about it. I'll, 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 I'll rule them out in a second. So then I started studying and praying and reading and studying and praying. And things are just coming at me, coming at me. And then finally one night, I just thought my head was going to explode. I couldn't sleep. I just couldn't take anymore. So I got up and went in the living room, and I, um, I said, Lord, you know when I prayed you to you to give me the truth? I don't want to know any more truth. <laughs> stop. I can't handle any more truth. I said, please make it stop. I just want to go back and be the best Protestant, the best Baptist minister I can possibly be. Thank you, Jesus. Good night. <laughs> now, instead of trying to find the truth, because it was going in a direction I didn't like, mm -hmm. I was now running from the truth. Mm -hmm. And so I decided the next day I was going to go to my, I was going to take over a new members class at church. And I was going to sit in and just, you know, prepare for that. And so you know, all these, like you said in your opening, all these people from different churches were asking questions. And there was a lady who was facilitating. And then questions would come up like, why do I have to be baptized? I was baptized as a Methodist. And the lady would say, you know, Reverend Allen, can you, say, can you give us some clarity on that? <laughs> so almost every issue that I was trying to avoid <laughs> came up. It was like, look, <laughs> it's like God was saying, hey, you asked for it, you got it. <laughs> and plus, I, you know, I couldn't run from it because a bell had been rung. You can't unring a bell. And I had heard the bell of the church, and now I was about to get all the smells mm. of the church. And so I got to the point where uh, you know, at that class, I gave them all the Baptist standard answers that I knew that they were the company line. I went home. I couldn't even look in the mirror. I had lied in my own mind. I had lost my integrity. Mm -hmm. And I had an Uncle Lewis who was um, a civil rights worker, and he had witnessed a, um, a murder. And they told him to lie about what he saw. And he didn't lie. He went and told the truth. And because he told the truth, they killed him. And I said, now, what, I, used to, I said, what kind of a person are you? Your favorite uncle, he stood up for the truth no matter what, and now you're standing here. What kind of, and I just didn't like myself much. And I told Elaine, I said, I can't do this anymore. I need to go talk to the pastor and just get um, a leave of absence in my ministries until I sort these things out. Mm -hmm. So you're leaning to the Catholic Church eventually in mm -hmm. the midst of this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, very soon, you've just looked at it all, right? Mm -hmm. After this. Uh, did Elaine come around? <laughs> well, I went to talk to my pastor, and that didn't go well. And by the time I left out of there, I knew I was not going to return to that church. And I was crying all the way home. Mm -hmm. he just, he just, it, it just went downhill, our, our, our conversation. And when I got home, I told Elaine, I said, you know, I'm going to start attending that Catholic church. For some reason now, mm -hmm. a year ago, I had done this in years, I went to a a, a baby baptism, a friend of mine was Catholic. I had no idea where I went. Mm -hmm. but I, I think the Lord knew. Because then I knew where to go. Mm -hmm. I knew I had a place to go when I was confused. But I told her I was going to start going to Catholic church. 
We had been married at that time about 21 years, mm -hmm. and we never really had a serious argument. A couple months, we barely spoke. She was very angry, very angry. I, I was dishonoring her father. I was causing her great embarrassment. Her friends thought I was crazy. The pastor's wife was calling her, telling her, just hang in there, he'll come to his senses. You know, people were saying, what about your children? You know, what are you going to do? You know, what about your salvation? I even had one uh, family member tell me, um, you know, you can't get to heaven from the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And he was serious, you know. So all those things were going on, and she was just devastated. And she, wouldn't, she didn't want to hear anything about it. So I just backed off mm -hmm. and prayed and asked God. I said, God, you know, we're one flesh. Uh, you know, I kind of kind of bartered with him like um, Abraham did. <laughs> you know, if you were... Um, if you want me on this journey, you're going to have to, I would, I would appreciate it if you would bring my other half. And, um, and he worked on her for me because I, I could, I, she wasn't talking to me about it. <laughs> <laughs> but she came around, you came in together. We way. came in together. You know, it was amazing because I, I, um, I, um, I had given up as far as trying to persuade her. But I just let things, you know, the Holy Spirit is, is wonderful how he worked. I saw signs that she was coming around. Like she'd ask me a question about this, I gave her an answer and back off. And then a big thing was she let me take the kids to mass. And no good mother is gonna let uh, her children go to something that she thinks is detrimental. And, and she started seeing things that I was struggling through, like Sola Scriptura, I was struggling through that. She saw it for herself. You know, she yelled out one evening, it's God's fault. I said, what are you talking about? She said, it's God's fault that this Bible is not as clear enough for everybody to read and understand it. Nobody can read this stuff and know it by itself. I said, um, that's it. You got, you've just figured out Sola Scriptura, why it doesn't work. Hmm. And so eventually she, um, she came to the right of um, acceptance, cried through the whole thing. And then one Sunday, one, we were sitting in Mass, and she walked in, and she sat down and said, I'm ready to give this a try. And God had worked a miracle. I, she'll tell her story one day how he converted her. But I'm just blessed and fortunate that yeah. a lot of ministers who go through this, their wives yeah. and don't come in with them. It takes a long time. It takes a long time. So long time. I'm glad God, God has blessed me with a good woman. Now, briefly, often when, when uh, especially men like yourself who were, whose gifts and emphasis in ministry were in the pastoral ministry and you become Catholic, mm -hmm. are you still involved? in uh, any apostolates now? Are you still using yes, your gifts yes, now? Yes. Um, the, the, the parish that I went to adopted me as their own. They give me responsibilities. I'm teaching RCIA. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the next year after I came into the church, my um, sister Michelle joined me at the church. Later on, so did my oldest son. Uh, so, so I got a chance to um, instruct in the faith. Um, I get to be a lector. I, um, I work with the youth. And so I'm, I'm right now, I'm just still feeling my way as far as what God wants me to do. In you're still get, in your studies right now? Still studying. And, I, and I, I took a year off from that because my wife took ill and I wanted to make sure that she was okay. And so um, we'll see what God has me. I even thought about the um, permanent diaconate and I did apply for it. But um, I guess the, in the wisdom of those who are discerning me, I need a little more time in the faith. And that's, that's that makes sense. Enough. That, that makes sense. Enough. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah, I understand. And we might, I might, I might revisit that in the future. On that. Well, the reality mm -hmm. is that you know, it, it, it's one thing to convert, but to become a Catholic, mm -hmm. it, you know, it takes a while. Takes a I, while. I've often yeah. said that you could become a Frenchman, mm -hmm. maybe by in citizenship, maybe a year. I don't know mm -hmm. how long yeah. it take, but for another Frenchman to mistake you as a real Frenchman, right? It takes <laughs> a while. <laughs> you know, because, yeah. you know, customs, language, and everything. Well, same mm -hmm. thing. Becoming Catholic, learning. All right, the aspects right, of our of mystical theology right. and stuff takes a long time. So, uh, and I'm still in that timing mm -hmm. thing myself in terms of uh, the diaconate. So, why don't we take a break now, okay. and uh, we'll be back in just a minute for your questions for Glenn Allen and his journey to the church. Welcome back. Our guest for tonight is Glenn Allen, mm -hmm. and he's done a fine job of condensing a huge journey, oh, which is true yeah, for all of his converts. A lot, lot, of, lot of details on it. But you did a fine, a fine job. Mm -hmm. um, you have a s tape series out, right? A video mm -hmm. that's called Truth Has No Color, mm -hmm. St. Joseph's Communication. Right. Talk a bit about 
this struggle. You mentioned it earlier, uh, the white man's church. Mm -hmm. You know, how did you, how did you confront that issue when you became Catholic? Well, you know, just true has no color, and just by definition, it doesn't have any color because it's the word of God. But the truth of the matter is, our truth comes to us packaged in different colors. And my problem was, I colored the truth based on my past experiences. I mentioned mm -hmm. all those things that, are, that had happened to me, yeah. you know, and um, uh, some of the things where I would live through the era of Jim Crow. I was forcibly bused and treated poorly at the school I was bused to. I marched in the civil rights movement for open housing in Milwaukee. I lived through the riots, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I saw all those things. And I was, like I said, at, and at the school, I was, I was beaten um, severely just for being black. So I, I, and I saw the Catholic Church as being white, so I didn't want to hear anything I had to say at that point. Mm -hmm. But you cannot color truth. You know, you know if, if you do that, if you actually color truth, then you've actually distanced yourself mm -hmm. from the truth. You have to, you can't judge the messenger by the, the message by the color of the messenger. So I, when faced with the truths of the Catholic Church was obviously coming real to me, I had to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And I said, I had to listen to Martin Luther King. But you don't judge a man by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. I had to listen to Peter when he said, God is no respect of persons, mm -hmm. but every man who fears him and work of righteousness is acceptable to him. So I had to get past that. Yeah. And then I thought, well, you know, a lot of people try to paint Jesus different hues. And that's okay, he's Lord of all. But if I had to go with the historical Jesus, if I had to guess, I'm just guessing here, <laughs> I would say he probably looked mm, like a Hebrew. <laughs> you know, and so, but what if he didn't? What if he looked like a blonde-haired, blue-eyed European? What if he didn't? So he looked like that. Should I reject what he's saying because I don't like how it's packaged? No. So I had to get by those yeah. things and not, re and not base what I heard on what color the person was telling it. Yeah. And, and so, and plus, you know, th that old thing about it's a white man's church. The church is a universal church. And, um, and yes, in a picture of, in America, it does seem to be that way um, because it's a Protestant country founded by Protestants and the majority of black people here are um, Protestant. But that's not a question of culture or um, theology. It's a question of slavery. Yeah. You know, the majority of slave owners were Protestant. Now we have some um, slave owners who are Catholic or in the Catholic areas, and we have a lot of black Catholics there, Maryland, Pennsylvania, um, Kentucky, and New Orleans. So that was circumstance of history that that. If you look worldwide though, um, look at the broader picture, there's over 200 million Catholics of African Americans. You, you make a neat point, yeah. we were talking earlier, this, mm. there was so much we talked about, mm. which obviously we don't time for everyone on the show, mm. but one thing you pointed out was the first ordained black priest in America mm. Yes. <laughs> he had to go somewhere else to get ordained. Right, right. Augustus Tolton, he had to go to Rome to get ordained because no... When was this, 18... 1886 he yeah. was ordained. And he had to go to Rome because no bishop in the United States would ordain a black person. So, yes, that's been... This church, has, just like but any institution, you know, racism is not... Yeah. Um, but I was going to say, the yeah. point was yeah. that in, from Rome, from the perspective of Rome, yeah. who's ordained right. men from every culture... Right. It was a whole different picture a whole different than picture. From looking at it. And from Rome America. has always been more progressive than the United States in those matters. Um, Pope Gregory XVI outlawed the slave trade in 1829, I believe. You know, they had, we had black saints way back in the, um, um, take Moses the Black in the fourth century. Yeah. And so it was always progressive. They go to, and that's what um, a Catholic layman named Daniel Rudd saw. Hmm. He was born about 1854. And he saw that the best hope for black people was in the Catholic Church because it had the experience of dealing with crossing cultures and nations and, and everything over its 2,000 year history. And he said, if the Catholic Church can be made to live up to its standards, it's the best place for black people because yeah. at the altar, we're all equal. Yeah. So in, in fact, fact so let me correct something you said to just, it isn't so much the Catholic Church living up to its standards, mm. Oh, sorry. It's, it's, uh, the it's Catholic. us Catholics, right? Right. right we right. would live up to thing, the standards. Right. You don't never, and that's what I said. You don't yeah. judge the church by individuals. Right. You know, the church is indestructible, is holy, but sometimes we don't act as holy. That's us. <laughs> you know, it's us, right? Let's take this first email, uh, Robert in Ohio, Mr. Allen. I am currently having discussions with a Baptist who claims he is not Protestant. Mm. 
-hmm. He says his roots are not in the Catholic Church. He says he is not, quote, protesting anything. He traces his spiritual roots to Jesus by way of, quote, other Bible believers through the centuries, end of mm -hmm. quote. He claims that Baptists are the remnant that were not corrupted by Constantine and the Catholic Church. Hmm. How would you respond to him? Thanks, Robert. Well, that's the, I've heard that when my, my minister told me that, you know, you know, the church apostatized under Constantine. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, Constantine, after him was the, the doctrine of the Trinity was formulated. After him, the Bible was formulated. So how can an uh, uh, apostate church get the scriptures and the doctrine of the Trinity and the, uh, um, the natures of Christ right? <laughs> so something doesn't jive there. And um, as far as him being the original Bible believers, the Bible, what did you do for the first four centuries then? Where was your faith? Because there, no, there was no finished no, Bible. No collected There was no Bible. collected canon. So if you were a Bible believer only, you didn't have a church for the first 400 years. Yeah. To be the true church or to be connected with the original Christians, you have to be apostolic. You have to be able to connect yourself back to the apostles. And I'm not talking about lip service, you know, spiritually I'm connected. You have to show a physical connection back, trace yourself back to the apostles and Peter. And you have to show that not only did you, that you can trace yourself back, but you believe and practice and teach what they did. So that's how you determine, I think, that's one yeah, thing. The, I don't want to belittle the, the mm -hmm. gentleman who felt that way in mm -hmm. that that the emailer was speaking about, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it sadly shows this, this thread amongst particularly fundamentalists, kind of an anti-historical view. Mm -hmm. You just got the Bible, yeah. that's all I need, mm -hmm. and I don't need to know any history from the apostles to right. the founder of my right. local church. You know, that... Uh, right. It ended at 20, Acts 28 and picked up at my church. You know, yeah. There's, yeah, a, there's you know, 1,500 the, years, 1,600 years, sometimes 1,900 years between right. those things. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, that's the only way that people can hold views like that. And, and it's sad, especially when they say they aren't even Protestant. Again, mm -hmm. that just shows they don't even know mm -hmm. the history and the right. struggles of the 16th century. Mm -hmm. Let's take our first caller, Andrea from Illinois. What's your question for us? Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for your program. And uh, I was raised a Southern Baptist. And uh, I, we converted in 2002. Welcome home. And, um, thank you. Um, I was just wondering how he handles Mary oh. and the rosary and things mm. like that. And I'll hang up the most of here. Thank you, Andrea. That was an easy one for a Baptist, right, Mary? Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, I've watched this show, and a lot of people stumble over Mary. But, I, you know, I had a different take on it. We didn't suffer that with Mary. My wife and I, we really didn't suffer that with Mary. Mm. You know, when I finally learned that through the misconceptions that Catholics don't worship Mary, that Catholics um, don't see her um, uh, as uh, equal with God. Yeah, we don't, fourth we, member we don't have the a Trinity, quadrinity, no, no quadrinity. <laughs> you know, we, 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 we formed the doctrine of the Trinity. So we don't have a quadrinity. And we see her as just being special and, a, and um, that she's a mother of God. So she has a special place. Yeah. And we give her honor for that. And we simply ask her to pray for us. And so once I saw that, we didn't stumble over it. We embraced it. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, I think it has something to do with my upbringing. See, in my culture, mothers are so important. Hmm. If you want to get in a fight, insult somebody's mother. <laughs> and, and that was out of me. So, and on Mother's Day in our church, biggest day of the year we come in there and, and mom would be honored and she win the contest because she had the most kids you know <laughs> and so and also my mother's a praying woman she'll tell you she raised 10 kids and we, we stayed out of trouble for the most part and she said because i stayed on my knees for my kids mm -hmm. so i had an example of a mother who prayed and and she had influence over me as a son she you know one time i had a spat with my brother and she said i said i'm not talking to my brother anymore she says, well, you get over here and you talk to your brother. I said, I don't have a brother. Goodbye, Mom. She said, she said before I said it, she said, you get over here at 10 o'clock. I said, I'm not coming over, Mom. I'm not talking to him anymore. I was there at 930. Because <laughs> that's the influence of a mother. Yeah. Just like Jesus was, yeah. was, was not ready for his ministry, the wedding feast at Cana, he said, um, you know, do what he says, do it. Mary points to Jesus. So we didn't really have a trouble embracing Mary and you look at Revelation 12, she is our mother of all Christians. Yeah. My wife loves it. She has rollers all yeah. over the house and pictures of the house too. Often converts, um, intellectually, we recognize all those things. Mm. 
but often the biggest stumbling block is when we're privately in our quote prayer closet mm -hmm. and now we're all of a sudden praying to Mary mm -hmm. where before we always prayed to Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's often a struggle. Was that a struggle or like you said you really moved no, fairly because quickly? I looked to that. at it as, you know, I don't ask my pastor to pray for me. Okay. I don't ask my mother. I, I called before I left the mom going down to Birmingham, pray for me. She said, okay. Yeah. But I can also go to Jesus and pray for my and ask him himself to pray for me. Right. The more prayers, the better. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the righteous prayers. Because it's really an understanding yeah. of the communion of saints. Right. I mean, that's the whole right. foundation for our understanding of Mary. Right. Okay, let's take, let's see, let's take our email first before we go, we have another caller. We'll go to the email first. God bless from Greg in Milford, Connecticut. Dear Margaret and Glenn, I just read in the paper that some more books of the Bible have been discovered. <laughs> hmm. What exactly does that mean? How will we know when we have all the books that should belong to the Bible? That's just strange because I was on the way down here. I was, um, I stopped in a layover in Atlanta and I talked to my baby sister and she said, there's an article in the paper they, you know, about these lost books of the Bible. And I said, you know, they're not lost. <laughs> Those, that's not new. They've been around for, since they've been around for hundreds of years. You can go to the library and read them. Those aren't lost books. They were books that didn't make it in. <laughs> Simple as that. And so how the question comes, I asked her, how do you think we came up with 27 books? Out of hundreds of gospels floating around during the early years of the church, how did we end up with 27 books? Somebody had to decide. The table of contents didn't just fall out the sky. And so you have to look at who did God entrust to collect the Bible? Who did God entrust to decide those 27 books with every Christian denomination accepts. There was only one church in town. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. God used the Catholic Church and inspiration of the Holy Spirit to decide what books belonged in the New Testament and he came up with 27. Okay. And, um, and that, that was another thing that got me. That my love of the scriptures really brought me into the church because, see, I based my whole life on these scriptures, on, the, on those 66 books of the Bible. I went by Revelations 22 as my standard, that no man can add, no man can delete. Then I discover that seven books were removed from the Bible in the 16th century. And there was, there was, there was, it was, the, the original Bible is 73 books. And it was based on the Septuagint, which was finished in 100 BC. So the Bible at the time of the apostles was the Septuagint. Mm. Later those 27 books were added, we had 73. No man can take those away. Luther did a book act to me, took away seven books. Then he took a scalpel to the New Testament and tried to remove James. Thank God he didn't get away with it. Mm -hmm. So I cannot now give Luther a pass, okay. understand it, when I wouldn't accept the Book of Moroni or New World Translation by the same standard. I had to go back and reclaim those seven books. All right, great. Let's try to get a caller in. Jill from Ohio. Hello, Jill. What's your question tonight? Uh, yes, hi. I watch your program all the time. Great. Um, I'm a convert to the Orthodox Church. Yeah. Um, I'm also African American, and um, our backgrounds are seem very similar. Um, I was wondering, how do you witness to people that come from, like, that are used to a gospel or a Baptist or a Pentecostal background? Most of the time, when I try to witness to my friends, they just say that the liturgy is boring or, you know, it's not enough mm -hmm. music or, you know, whatever. What is a good way to tell people about the church with love? So we'll get them interested, other yeah. black people interested in coming. Mm -hmm. And just an aside, I didn't have a problem with Mary either, and I also have an icon of St. Mm -hmm. Moses the Black in my house. So. <laughs> All right. Thank mm -hmm. you, Joe, for your question. Um, you know, I just say, tell them the truth. That's where I look at it. Lay it out there. Don't hold anything back because they're black. Don't assume because they're black they can't understand. Don't assume that they, don't, leave, don't water it down because they can't comp comprehend, and don't be afraid they're going to reject you uh, some things you say. You lay out the truth. Time-tested method works for black, white, everybody. Lay out the truth and let the Holy Spirit have a chance with the, with the full information of the church, because otherwise they're going to find out one day yeah. anyway. And so that puts the impetus on you. That means that you have to tell your faith, and that means you've got to know your faith, and then you've got to live your faith. Because sometimes, what's the old adage? Preach the gospel always, and sometimes use words. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, just tell them, and they will come. I came. And then beyond that, I think you have to um, ask yourself, I think the broader question is, what do you do when they do come? How do you retain them? You know, I, I agree with that completely, because 
And the devil laughs a bit, right? Because mm. the devil will get us to focus on our eccentricities mm. and say, I'm not going to be able to get through this or that mm. uh, with the gospel. And it's really grace anyway. Mm. that converts. We right. just have to trust the work of the Spirit. Right. I, I use the Peter principle of evangelization. I think it's 1 Peter, um, I believe it's 3, where he says, don't be afraid. That's what he says basically. I'm paraphrasing a little yeah. bit. Don't yeah. be afraid, he says. He said, and um, be prepared for rejection. Your job, though, is to keep Christ in your heart yeah. and always be ready to give a reason, an answer for why you have this hope, but do it with kindness and reverence. We kind of, sometimes we forget that. And I think then you lead, lead the rest up to the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's take, uh, let's take another email. Um, this comes from Carol and Jesse in Texas. We share with us how you first felt when you realized that the Eucharist is oh. the body and blood of Christ. It's a bit different yeah. than how you felt as a Baptist. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of those things that, that you know, I, uh, you asked a question at the end of the, the, <laughs> the, you know, and they kind of got me here ahead of time. And um, I've always wondered about that when I was a Baptist minister, I remember one time I got in trouble because I had not been ordained and I was filling in and I distributed communion. And he can't do that, he's not ordained. Then when I was ordained, I went to my new church and the pastor told me, I'm going out of town and when you don't let deacon so and so handle the, you know, the communion because he's not ordained and don't let anybody take it that's not baptized. Announce that. I'm saying to myself, what's the big deal? <laughs> it's just crackers and grape juice. It's symbolic. Why all this fuss about who can take it and who can handle it? Yeah. It didn't seem to fit. In know. fact, let me ask you this. As mm -hmm. a Baptist, did you believe in baptismal regeneration? <laughs> I mean, the point oh, being... Oh, and, it, I mean, as far as... Oh, you mean... Oh, okay, I get to mean... You what know, is, words, was, it, was it, the baptism... It, no, baptism was an outward sign of inward works. So if they haven't been baptized... If they haven't been baptized... It didn't make, it's not, why would you be concerned about one thing that is non-effective? It's, it's, it's a symbolic thing but you got to do another symbolic thing before you can do the first symbolic thing. I mean, it, it, it's just, it just, I didn't see why would you have to be baptized. It was just um, immoral anyway. And so anyway, when I, um, it didn't fit the scriptures either, I saw. You know, I saw in John 6 that God really meant, Jesus really meant for us to eat his body and drink his blood. It didn't fit Corinthians 10 where he said this is a participation with the body. And Corinthians 11 where it says if you don't discern that it's the body, you can um, get sick or even worse. So when I realized that it was a body and blood of Christ, you know, it, it drew, me, drew me closer. I've already had an intellectual and a scriptural and a spiritual way of getting close to God. Now I had a physical way of drawing near to God. And it's like, I think Gregory the Great put it the best. He says, when you receive the Eucharist, you become what you receive. Hmm. So if, when I received the body of Christ, I became the body of Christ. I don't think you can get much closer than that. <laughs> so that's how we did that. We've got some great emails. I don't think we're going to be able to go to them because uh, mm -hmm. of time. Um, in closing, uh, how would you say in what way has mm -hmm. becoming a Catholic brought you closer to Christ? Okay. Has it brought you closer yeah, to just Christ? Just describe one, okay. of course, the Eucharist yeah. and the sacraments. But also I think the communion of the saints. You know, I didn't have access like I have now. Because I know God's good friends, I know his mother. You know, if you want to get next to me, get next to my mother. Mm -hmm. So now through the intercession of Mary and the saints, now I'm closer to God because I'm drawn, because I'm closer to his friends. And of course, as I already said, because now I actually become the body of Christ. You can't get much closer than that. All right. Thank you yeah. so much for being okay. on the program. Thank you for having it me. It is a great privilege okay. to have you. It's always Time good to so have fast. you. I know it does. <laughs> I know it does. We're going to take a real short break. We'll be back in a little bit for some final words for the journey home. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Glenn gave us a wonderful uh, profession of his faith and uh, emphasized the, this, this issue of struggling to determine what is the true church. And his own personal experience of his family was a mm. model of that and how mm. he brought up Methodists. Uh, they are all brought up Methodists, but in time, each with a conversion, uh, an adult conversion to Jesus, found it in other traditions, all of which coming from different angles and wondering which is true. And even though now their family is very much back together in yeah. love, 
uh, and accept. And still, this issue loomed and formed a big part of his journey. And I thought about that. And I think, you know, there's many reasons why we see so many converts today. In our work in the Coming Home Network, a week doesn't go by when we aren't contacted by two or three uh, new Protestant ministers that are considering becoming Catholic. Now, th listen, hear me again. Two or three new Protestant ministers are contacting the Coming Home Network every week. In the last 10 years, we've seen Protestant clergy converts from over 60 different denominations in America, not just mainline Anglican, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian. We're seeing them from Assembly of God, Church of Christ, independent churches, Protestant. What is causing this rise in interest, especially in the last 50 years? I do believe one of the main reasons is the media and the witness of EWTN on television and radio and internet and cable. Uh, the increase of Catholic books uh, that bring the witness of the church to so many uh, tapes, audio tapes and videos like Glenn's uh, videotape. But there's another issue that I find fascinating. It's a sociological issue. Because if you and I were to go back about 100, 150 years, you would find that people in general were loyal to their tradition for life. If they were baptized Methodist, they stayed Methodist all their life. They were baptized Catholic, baptized Lutheran. They would live and die that faith and would, would uh, avoid the possibility of changing because they would feel they would be uh, cursing or denying their ancestry. I remember going to s seminary with men who were becoming Baptist or, Baptist or Presbyterian ministers because their father and grandfather and great father had all been ministers before. This is the way it was 100 and 150 years ago. But things changed in the mid-50s, 60s. This loyalty seemed to be lost for a variety of reasons. And as I said earlier, when I was a minister with new members' classes, every four months when I led the new members' class, there would be people from other traditions, ex Episcopalians and Methodists and Lutherans. People, when they move to another town, don't always pick the church they came from. They look around with all these other criteria. And one of the reasons I believe that this has opened our eyes to so many converts is that now people are looking outside of their original tradition. They're not only seeing Methodism, they're starting to see Baptists and Congregational and Presbyterian, Episcopalian, and they're wondering, why the confusion if we're all based on one Bible? And that, as Glenn said earlier, is because God instituted the guide to the scriptures through Christ as he appointed the apostles and gave them the Holy Spirit as the guide to what is true. The church was given to us as that interpreter. When we turn our back on the church, we end up with confusion. We turn back to the church, we hear the guide of the inspiration of the Spirit. I hope this episode of Journey Home has been an inspiration. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Mm -hmm.